This program contains sensitive content, which some may find disturbing and inappropriate for younger audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Hi, and welcome to Strategies for Strongholds. I am your host, Pastor Ron Woolsey, and today we're going to be talking about mentoring and support. And uh, our guest today is uh, Pastor Jay Gallimore, one of our board members in Coming Out Ministries. And we're delighted to have you with us today, Pastor Jay. It's a delight to be here. Thank you. And uh, before we start our conversation, let's have a word of prayer. Sure. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for another time that we can work together and promote your word and your will and your way. We pray that you will be with our conversation today as we talk about strategies for strongholds. May you be glorified and many people be blessed. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. You know, Pastor Jay, I, uh, I remember that you and I went to school together years ago, but I didn't know you and you didn't know me. Right. Um, you, I found out you were a year ahead of me, which meant that I could always look up to you. <laughs> um, and then when we first met, and you may not have recalled, but the first time we personally met was at a camp meeting in Michigan. And uh, I don't know whether you really remember that either. I don't really. But I was there speaking and doing music, and I was, after the camp meeting, or after my part in it anyway, I was packing up my trailer, my marimba in the trailer and everything, and you drove by in a golf cart and you stopped and introduced yourself and offered to have prayer with me, and that was very meaningful. I've never forgotten that. Mm. And now we're just so pleased that you are a part of our ministry, Coming Out Ministries. And, you know, in light of the, uh, our program about strategies for strongholds, strategies to break the addictions, yes. the strongholds of addictions, I'm wondering if you could explain why you think Coming Out Ministries is so relevant today. It's a good question. The truth is our world is filled with addictions. Everywhere you turn, Satan is in the business of addicting people to something. One of the strongest and most powerful things known to mankind is the gender attraction or the sexual drives that we have. They're not bad, they're good, because God created them. Now what's, of course, we know, you and I both know, that through degeneration over time, these things have, uh, we have predispositions to things, not in the genes, but they're just predispositions, environment and so forth. And Satan's trying to get people uh, addicted to the wrong kinds, the wrong expressions of things that God has created. So Coming Out Ministries, while it's focused on the, uh, L, uh, the LGBT, if I got that correct, plus, uh, LGBT, I get it right here, plus, uh, even though it's focused on that, many of the strategies they have will be a, a blessing to a lot of others. But we live in a world today that is broken when it comes to sexual expression. It's just broken. Well, we're living... Just everywhere we look, we see this battle going on. It's like the whole world is polarized. Correct. Uh, you have the left and the right, and you have good and evil. You have uh, um, unchurched and churched. And even within the church, I'm talking about the Christian church in yeah. general, yes. there seems to be this great polarization. There's this great conflict going on. What's that all about? <laughs> well... It's, it's a battle between Christ and Satan. And, and the, the great controversy boils down to this. And I think Moses got it right, and Jesus certainly reiterated it when the scribe asked him what the greatest commandment was. And Jesus responded, quoting Moses, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mm -hmm. your soul, your mind, your strength. And the second is like it, it reflects it, is to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, why is that important? We live in a world that's broken over morality. What is moral? And so we have these huge struggles, these huge divisions. So you have one group of people saying, we are, we've got the moral right. We've got the moral high ground. In fact, that's when you, you look at this uh, movement that's uh, around us and it's growing in power. Uh, you, you look at this and you, 
and they say, we got the moral high ground. You, you cannot put people down because of their orientation, so to speak. Well, we shouldn't be putting anybody down. That's not our business. Right. But then you got, you know, the other side and, and, uh, and so there's all this clash and people trying to figure it out. Who is morally right? Morality cannot be subscribed or given to mankind because just using as illustration, if you have a different set of morals than I do, then why would my, my morals be any better than your morals or vice versa? Yeah, you're, you're touching on so many hot buttons with uh, me here. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I just wonder, can this be simplified in, uh, I'm very simplistic. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> in, in talking about focus, when you have polarization, for example, in, in, in the context that we're talking of here, one focus is, you know, love God supremely. You focus on God first and others and yourself last. The other focus is self first. Right. Yes. And maybe other second and God last. Can it be that simple that it's just a matter of where you're focused? Absolutely. In this great controversy? Here's the issue. It's authority. Yeah. So if your morals are as good as my morals, then who's going to prevail? And so people just duke it out and whoever's left standing's morals are in charge. Mm. But that's not morality. Man has to have a source, authoritative source of morality, and that comes from God. And if you don't love God, if you don't respect Him, if you don't take Him serious, as we say in the Scripture, or as it says in Scripture, to fear God, which means to take Him serious, then you don't have any authority for morals. That's the clash. So when people reject God and they turn their back on Him, then they choose their own morals. And we see what that's done to the world. That's what Lucifer did. In right. the beginning, he said to God, look, I can live a selfish life and I can still live. And I'm paraphrasing. And God says, no, you can't. And he says, yes, I can't. God is not being arbitrary. These, the, the morality that comes from God is essential to life. This, this reminds me of people saying, well, you have your truth and I have my truth. Yeah, exactly. What's wrong with that? There's plenty wrong with it because you can't have two sources of truth. Because and you can't truth, have two truths that clash. One is wrong and one is right. Because truth is fact. Yeah, exactly. And, and you can't believe gravity works one way and I believe it the other way and That's both right. be right. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Uh, in our ministry, and we've been talking about strategies for overcoming yeah. from the very beginning. Wonderful. Uh, because there's a... A mantra out there, you know, once gay, always gay. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, th I think that it only takes one person to prove that wrong, Amen. right? If one person can come out of that and um, demonstrate the power of Jesus Christ to save from sin and from homosexuality, uh, then that whole argument is, is uh, defeated and you don't need the majority to prove something is right. So um, why, um, why do you think that our message is uh, resisted by some within the religious world that supposedly have the same rule of faith and practice and the same theology? What's going on there? Well, let me go back first of all to what you just said. And the fact is that we have governments in, around the world in certain places that are piling on laws. You cannot change. They don't want you to change. They don't even want Christians to pray for people. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of laugh at that. And I, all of us understand we're not here to force people to do anything. Right. We don't believe in that. But I, I kind of laugh. I said, well, let the government make all the laws they want, but they mm -hmm. cannot defeat the Lord Jesus and the power of the Lord Jesus. There is a sense in, in some Christian circles that they don't believe in the miracle working power of God. Exactly. They do not believe that a person can be born again, that you can take a person that is just um, beat up by sin. Isn't there a passage of scripture that refers to that, a form of godliness? A form of the... godliness. That's exactly. Right. The, other thing that, the other thing that makes this unplatable is that Christians who don't believe in the miracle working power or the power of this wonderful Jesus that we serve, then they also tend to want to go along with the culture. So mm -hmm. the, Christianity then becomes a cultural thing 
not a biblical thing. Right. And so they have a form of godliness. It sounds nice. We love, we're nice. We should always be nice. Mm -hmm. But you also have to call sin by its right name. It also has right. to be called that. If you keep practicing that, if you don't let Jesus change your heart, whether it's this or whatever it might be, if you don't let him change your heart, if you don't let him experience his forgiveness and his atoning grace and you become a new person and you no longer practice whatever you were doing in your old lifestyle, it, if you don't believe that and if that doesn't happen to you, you become what we would call a cultural Christian. Exactly, rather than a, a person of faith. And you mentioned laws. Uh, I know that around the country, laws are being passed by states and by communities that are actually outlawing counseling young people, in particular teenagers, mm -hmm. young people, even if they have unwanted same-sex attractions. I remember when that first law was being passed out in California uh, and the, the penalty would be you'd lose your license uh, for counseling someone who wants help with the LGBT issue. Now, you could counsel that person to embrace it and just be who you are, but if you counsel them that there's a way out, you could lose your license. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I don't have a license, so I have nothing to worry about. Mm -hmm. but, but the other thing is uh, the Gospel Commission. Uh, I mean, we are commissioned to go into all the world. Uh, this is a, it is a, a, a spiritual thing. Mm -hmm. And God's law, I believe, uh, supersedes man's law. So if these laws are being passed that you can't counsel young people, maybe, uh, maybe you would agree, then, then we are obligated to follow God's law first because it's, it's uh, the commission. It's, uh, it's sharing the gospel. So. Absol absolutely, in other words, this is a spiritual issue and the government needs to keep out yes, of it. I agree. But there, many of these are evolutionists. They're coming from, they don't believe in God to start with. They're very mm -hmm. secular. I'm talking about people that are making these laws and they're very anti-Christian. Many of them are. So they make these laws out of an abundance. I say it's sweet kindness. Mm -hmm. They make it out of abundance of ignorance. And they, they are afraid of organizations like Coming Out Ministries that can demonstrate not just one or two, but can demonstrate many, many times over and over again how God has taken a person that's fallen into these particular traps mm -hmm. and God has taken them out of it, changed their life. They've done a 180 degree turn and they are happy, wonderful, um, practicing Christians and God is, and they're so grateful. They're so grateful. They're scared of that. They're frightened of it. That's why they make laws against it because they are in this cultural thing, maybe either secular or even uh, cultural Christians, and they're afraid of it because it shows the power of God. But I have bad news for them. They're not gonna win. You cannot stop the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you cannot stop people from witnessing to other people from a spiritual standpoint that this is not the right way to go and it will destroy your life here. And I say it with sweet kindness. It'll destroy you for eternity. Now that goes for any sin that people continue to practice in. So we're not trying to, to set one apart unique, but we're talking about this particular thing. But this thing is taking over our world. Our world has gone, I was talking to somebody just the other day and I said, the world has gone insane. Mm -hmm. It's just going insane. I mean, how many genders can you have? Right. And last time I heard someone was counting a hundred. Yes. Well, yes. if it's a hundred, then 98 of them are the figment of somebody's imagination. I say right. that, I know somebody would get upset with me on that, but and I say it kindly. People can believe what they want to believe and I'm not into the forcing business. I'm not here to make laws to twist somebody's arm. But the point is, you cannot stop Jesus. Look at the early Christian church. If you read the book of Corinthians, and you and I know that, they were coming from all kinds of backgrounds, including oh, yeah. homosexuality. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, exactly. 10. They were yes. coming from all that kind of stuff. And Jesus was just changing their lives, changing their lives. Mm -hmm. Such were some of you. That's right. And you look at the heterosexual practices where they had temples where the women and men were priests and 
people were interacting with them in an immoral way, but out of that would come babies mm -hmm. and they would sacrifice these babies to their gods. Right. We found in Phoenicia, where they found uh, thousands of these to my understanding. Um, uh, little babies that had been basically sacrificed to the gods. So this is the kind of world that we're starting to, to live in where today we just sacrifice on the altars of our lust. Mm -hmm. uh, I know we're not into abortion here, but this is part of the whole big scene, scene right. here. But So the sexuality thing, but Jesus in the New Testament is giving people victory, victory, victory over all of this uh, sexual immorality, no matter what direction it comes from. And I'll tell you, Jay, why, why this is so important to coming out ministries is because uh, we are examples. All yes. of us in this ministry are uh, that come from that gay background. Yeah. I mean, we are examples you are. of people who had unwanted same-sex attractions. That's right. So what about those people? What about their free will? What about, uh, I mean, is, that, is it fair to brainwash them into thinking there's no way out, that you cannot be changed when they want to come out. And that's why we introduce the strategies that we have to, um, uh, for example, I share in some of my material how the Lord worked to get my attention, yes. to hold my attention, yeah. to convict me, yes. to convert me, and to sustain me. And these are the strategies that we're trying to share because many mm -hmm. people in the gay community do not want to be stuck there. And so it's up to those who have come out that have the answers to, to you know, cry loud and spare not and say, hey, you don't have to stay in bondage. Amen. You know, the gospel, what I love about the gospel is that it has a solution for all kinds of sin. There's right. no, there's no sin that the gospel cannot address and change. That's why I love the first chapter in the book of Romans, it, you know, where it says the just shall live by his faith. In other words, it is this faith in Christ that makes a huge difference in people's lives. So when we start to talk about strategies, the first thing that a person needs, no matter what they're trapped in, whether it's the gay lifestyle or whether it's some other kind of lifestyle, the first thing they need to do is they need to turn their eyes upon this marvelous Jesus and put their trust in him. I need to interject something there yes. because you mentioned the book of Romans. Yes. And I was absolutely shocked to hear not long ago, theologians actually saying that the books of Moses and the books and the books of Paul are not necessarily um, uh, relatable to us today or applicable to us today. And here you are referring to one of the letters of Paul. <laughs> but I'll tell you, Jay, and then I'll let you talk about this. I would not be here today if it were not for the Apostle Paul. And I know his writings are difficult to understand at times, but my, the writings of Paul just really steered me right into the path, the narrow way which leadeth unto eternal life. And there's something here about, uh, in, in one of these questions about the gospel portrayed in Romans, uh, as the only hope for people caught up in the power of the LGBT culture. What is it about Romans that people don't like? And, and I have a theory that the reason these books, quote unquote, don't apply to us today is because they contain material we don't like. Not we, but material that, that crosses our fallen human nature. No question. You take the first chapter of the book of Romans and it starts out by people wanting to be in charge of themselves. And then it starts out uh, telling how we just keep going downhill. We start worshiping gods. We turn our back on God. Basically what it's talking about is people want to be in charge of their own life. They don't want God in their life. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's the second, uh, third chapter that talks about they have no fear of God. By the way, if you look look at that list of things and it talks about the uh, homosexual issues, lesbian issues in the first chapter of the book of Romans. There's no question what Paul is talking about there. Right. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to get this. No, I got it. I was gay and I read it and I knew it was talking to me. Yes. I didn't have to guess. That's right. <laughs> and he's not even talking about that, but he's talking about heterosexual uh, yeah. immorality as well. And then if you go to chapter three, which is one of the great chapters on the gospel, and it, and it lists a whole nother list of sins in there. And it talks about 
about sin being like a snake with its, I'm paraphrasing here, but its throat is like an open grave. Mm -hmm. That's what sin does to us. Mm -hmm. It's self-destructive. And God, God should be angry about sin because he loves us. And it robs him of his children. Precisely. Couldn't have said it better myself. And we love our children, so we, God, it's the same way. So, but you'll find yourself in there. You'll find, oh, yeah. you'll find your, everybody will find, because we're all broken, we'll find ourselves in there. But then it gets down and it says, because there is no fear of God in their eyes. Oh my, yeah. Now, what does that mean? It means simply. Respect. They don't take God serious. Exactly, yeah. If you take God serious and he says, no, don't do that, if you take him serious, you're not going to do that. And, um, but I want to talk about the gospel and what that does, whether it's uh, for, the, for the gay people, and this has become so prevalent, they need the gospel like never before. Let me insert one thing please. here because I'm going back just a little yeah, ways because you brought up culture mm -hmm. and scripture. So would you say that one strategy that is so important for overcoming these strongholds of addiction is getting your root uh, rule of faith and practice right, Correct. that it should be based upon scripture and not culture. We should view culture through the lens of scripture rather than viewing scripture through the lens of culture. Well is said. I couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, one of the great Protestant principles was that we're saved through scripture mm -hmm. alone. In other words, it becomes the authoritative. Because so, it's unchanging. Yeah, it's unchanging. It's impacted the world. Where would we be without Scripture today? People need to think about that. Where we are now. Yeah, where we're going. <laughs> right. Uh, the United States of America, the greatest nation that's ever been on the face of the earth, is the result of Scripture, yes. the authority yes. of Scripture. But so coming back to the, to the gospel, and here's why the gospel is power. It's power not simply because of theory. Now, you need the right theory. You need the right truth, so don't get me wrong on that. Um, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But the gospel, when you embrace the gospel, when you put your faith in Christ, something marvelous happens. When you say, Lord Jesus, I trust you. Forgive me of my sins. Transform me. That justification, Paul talks about that justification, that's not just, it is, but it's not just a legal transaction. God writes your name in that book of life, but he does something else. He comes in, Ron, and makes you, whoever reaches out in faith to Christ, makes them a new creation. Amen. A new creation. Oh, that's a very important point with our ministry. Yes. yes. And we are, so, and then there's something else. Paul explains it in another place in Colossians chapter one, where he says, uh, for me, uh, no, that's in, that's in Philippians, where he says, for me to live is Christ. Mm -hmm. but, it's, but in Colossians, he says, it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So here's what I want to say to our listeners. When you embrace the gospel, you don't just embrace a theory. You embrace the living Christ and the Holy Spirit. And I can't explain. I don't need to explain how. I don't need to know how even, but it's a fact. You just need to believe it. You got to believe the Holy Spirit brings the living Christ into my heart. And now he controls my selfishness. See, the, 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 the gay lifestyle, all of this stuff that Paul talks about in chapter one, all of this is about selfishness. It's about me, myself, and me. Mm -hmm. But if we live that way, we're going to be very unhappy and we cannot live in a heaven where everybody is unselfish. You know, when you talk about the, the power that's there, yeah. it reminds me of the text um, that by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth, for he spake that's and right. it was done. He commanded right. and it stood fast. That's right. And that same power, that was creative power, that same recreative power is in his word because when he told Mary, neither do I condemn thee, which the LGBT community loves. Mm. But then he goes on and says, but go and sin no more. Yes. And that's considered hate speech in some circles. Yes. And yet that's power, that spoken word, and it's now the written word. It's, it's when you say there's recreative power in the word, 
it, there's a recreative power because the Word leads us to the Savior and the Savior comes into our hearts and lives. That's a supernatural thing. Yes, it is. And He, by the way, grace, this is all because of God's grace, and grace is the enemy of sin. It's the enemy of sin. It's not the enabler of sin. Because grace is power. It's grace divine, is omnipotent, transforming power. That's right. Colossians pictures Jesus as the great creator, as you were just mentioned. And I love that part where it talks about that God leads us from the darkness. And that's what this whole mess is. The darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love. And then it describes that if there's always that condition, you know, if we continue to trust him, this living Christ by living by faith comes into us. He now sits on the throne of my life. He gives the, I may have, in, I may have, I may have uh, tendencies to whatever sin there is. I may have an inclination to go there. I may have temptations, mm -hmm. but Jesus is sitting on the throne of my life and his power, his, this is a powerful Jesus we serve. Right. His power keeps us from sinning. And if we do slip on the banana, if we, if we lose faith and we do slip on the banana peeling of temptation, He doesn't leave us there. He will pick us back up, dust us I off. I think you just touched on another strategy. It is. A strategy for breaking down these strongholds of addictions. Yes. Trust. We yes. must trust. And it's like the old song, and I, I, I use this song a lot because yeah. it's trust and obey. Yeah. You don't have to understand everything nope. to obey because where's the trust? That's right. and, and I think that's a very powerful um, point uh, or a strategy right there. Um, we just have like a minute left and maybe very briefly you can uh, give a word of encouragement to church leaders on how to incorporate coming out ministries and their strategies they should. Uh, in, in their ministry. Bring coming out ministries into your camp meetings. Bring them into your ministers' meetings. Uh, use this resource. This is a powerful resource and you really need that. Your members need it. Your young people, bring it into your academies. And I would say this to colleges, bring coming out ministries into your colleges and universities. Let young people see what Jesus can do and what he is doing and he will continue you to do. Don't be afraid of doing this. You shouldn't be afraid because that's a culture pressure. We should stand up and say, we love everybody. We don't care where you've come from, but if you've been trapped by sin, no matter what sin that is, we have coming out ministries and we're bringing them, we want you to hear their testimony. We want you to hear what Jesus has done. We want you to be into their strategies and I believe you will not be disappointed. Amen. Thank you so much, Jay, for being with us today and sharing your expertise with us. Revelation 12, 11, remember, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. 